Hello, everybody. This is the data science learning community, and we are explaining a chapter 12, local diagnostic plot from the exploratory model analysis book. And I hope this book club helps you to understand better the chapter. The chapter starts with an interesting proposition. It says, if a model presents satisfactory overall predictive performance, but is a is less accurate from some observation, then we can say that the model doesn't cover where some areas of the input space. So basically, when you are creating a model, sometimes for some parts the model doesn't perform really well. We know that classical example we will have a real bio curva too. Uh, or we have a spawning function and we try to feed a linear model, we know that in, for some parts, yes, we have a good feed, but for others, it's horrible. So we know that in, the model is not covering the whole input space. Most of the time, we just, it's enough to know the overall performance, but when we need to make important decisions based on our predictions, it's not like sometimes we, we, we train models and are for how to make a, a small decision. So overall, you make some mistake. It doesn't matter, but you are making important decisions based on the result of the model. You really need to be and to be sure that your response for this particular observation, this particular prediction is accurate. To make that possible, we have two, two different tools. We have the local, the infinity, the finite, the finite plots to evaluate the local predicted performance of the models around the observation of interest. That is what I want to know. How accurate is this prediction? And we know that based on how accurate is that prediction for the close observations, for the front observation in the training set. Even though the observation that we want to predict is not in the training set, we can do, we can check how the mother is doing with the observations that are close. So we have a little bit of, we, we need to measure distance for the, with this chapter. And also we have local stability. Uh, and we have the local stability plots. That's the stability of prediction around the observation of interest. How consistent is the prediction around the neighbors? That we're going to see in this chapter. So the first step to make this, uh, let's subset the observation similar. Let's select a subset of observation similar to observation of interest, also known as neighbors. That's the first step. We need to take, okay, this is the observation, and we need to go to the training set and say, these observations are similar to this one. Now we can compare the distribution of the silvers of the neighbors mm -hmm. and the entire training data set except the neighbor. So we subtract the neighbor from that. So we, we don't want to repeat data. Uh, by creating the local fidelity plots and running uh, maybe a statistical test. You can do it maybe by simulation or maybe using parametric statistical tests, but you can do it because you are taking the difference on means of residuals. And this is the formula of residuals. So it's the, the original value means the predicted value. We can also check how the, uh, how the small difference of the quarterly variables present the neighbors can influence the prediction across the range of each variable by comparing the CP profiles of each observation and create a local stability plot. Let's explain a little bit how the local fidelity plot works. We, we have this plot. We have the red color for all residuals, and the blue one just showing the 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 twenty five most similar 
uh, predictions. And what we can see, you're watching the plot, is that the, 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 the general distribution is centered around zero. So that's a good. So the model is not biased in that moment. But in the for 21, 25 neighbors, we have we have a mean around 500. And we can see how the model is visited towards a smaller values. So yeah, maybe that prediction is not so accurate in that because we are not just watching random error that that's what we want to see as a residual. And we need to take that into consideration that you are getting positive values. That's because the original values, the original value was higher than the predicted one. So you are underestimating the value. But in the other hand, we also can check how the predictions was around a uh, work for a range of values from a particular value using the CP profiles. And we can also compare the CP profiles, for example, of the 10 natives observation neighbors. And we can see, for example, that in this particular example, that the profile have almost the same shape. They are really parallel. Even though we are plotting them, we just just can see five lines because one of them are one overlapping to other. So that's good because it's showing a consistent prediction. We also can uh, learn a lot more from those CP profile if we add the residual for its CP profile. And based on how many positive residuals and negative presi uh, residuals, we also can check if the prediction is biased. And let's explore a little bit here. In the center, we can see the, our interest profile. And then we, we have several lines. For every particular line, for example, they are taking the E, so they are not picking, picking any specific number. They select, oh, and this is the actual value for the distance between the, the, the value, the original value, and the predicted value is the residual that we want to spot. And see, and here we have four, three positive residuals and we have five residuals, so it's not as biased, you know, it's not, I don't see a big difference to say, hey, it's biased because all is positive or all is negative. They, they, they are expecting to see that, uh, that balance in the prediction. Do you have a question so far? Okay, let's continue. And every time that we talk about neighbors, that's always a problem. We are facing the same problem that we saw for a for the this other model that was uh it's lying. I think mean, it was sharply local and the analysis center. Local uh, line, yeah, that we saw for line that to define what is a neighbor can be challenged and how many observations would you take for the model? Yes, you know, it's a really open, uh, open you can take your own decision. You just need to, to state your reasons why you are picking the name, the number of neighbors that you are picking. You know that if you take less neighbors, you will be, you have a more local analysis. So you won't be, uh, you won't be picking information that is maybe not relevant to uh, to your particular observation. 
because you want to keep your analysis local, not global. But if you have more neighbors, you will have less variability in your resource. You will be you have more information to take your final decision. The order is relative to how many observations have your training data. They explain that you take, for example, 20, that could be fine. But if, for example, if your data set only have maybe 100 observations, maybe 20 is too much to, to, to say that it's a lockup. So that would depend on how many observations, but the, if you have a large number of observations, yeah, 20 is a good number to start. And also you need to define a metric uh, to show proximity between observations. Uh, we know the Euclidean distance, the Manhattan distance, the means conscious distance, also the cosine distance, are all possibilities. Any of these, this is using this package, but you are using just numeric data or you transfer your data just to all to numeric, uh, you could use all of these. Things. Also the function, the function that use this package open the pos that possibility. You might maybe to create right. your custom function to make that possible, but you can do it. And also it's important though, as most, as many, you have more predictors, your results and interpretation about why it's near and why it's not near, we differ between one metric to another Depend, uh, if you have many predictors. If you have your maybe two predictors, three predictors, you highly be doing the same thing, but you have many predictors, maybe 100 predictors. Yeah, you, what is close or far away can be, can differ based on the metric that you are using to calculate distance between observations. Here is the, the, the way that we, the, the, the Gower symmetric measure is the method that we use in this chapter that they recommend. Why? Because it can manage categorical and continuous variables. I don't know if you know another metric that allows you to have both cate categorical and numeric data. So far, this is the only one I know. This is a uh, really new. So it's like you would take the average, you know, the average for all predictors based on this distance. And this function of distance uh, between observation, because it's like this is one observation and this is another observation. This is a pair pairwise operation between rows. It's like this is a row and it's also another row. The problem with this is that it doesn't take in consideration correlation between variables or variable importance. They explain also in the book that the measuring that the distance that we have in the random forest is really good to make that, to make those appreciations. But for we are using a, a, a model agnostic model, we want to use a metric that we can use for any kind of model, not just for random forest. If the variable is continuous, the distance would be the absolute difference between its variable for the specific column K, the specific column K that we are using, and then we subtract between the range. So you will take the mass value minus mean value of that column. That's the range. In that perspective, you will make sure that your value uh, is lower than one. The max value, your difference is like, okay, this is the max value and this is the zero, then you will get the equal one uh, coefficient. And here for categorical, if the variables are different, then you have one, otherwise if they are equal, you will get a zero. At least that's interpretation I'm using because in the book, this symbol was equal. And I asked in a pull request. So they should change it because it doesn't make sense to 
doing the other way around. It's like, if, the, if you have, for example, two equal numeric values, then you will have a zero in the, the, in the numerator. And you need to keep that zero also here when they are equal. That's, that's why I think they should change that part. Let's see how it goes. Any any doubt in the in the formula so far? It's a good function. Okay, so let's continue. So, what are the pros and cons for this strategy? For local fidelity. Pros are useful to checking whether the model field of instance of interest is unbiased. As the as and in that case, the residuals should be small. So the distribution like your uh, standard standard error should be a small. And the and the in it should be also symmetric to zero. And like you are expecting what you expect for a normal distribution. They should be random and they should be around zero. So you will have biased distribution of residuals. And local stability. So that, that means that your difference are due to random noise and not for something that you are not predicted correctly. That, that's the point. Uh, for local stability, plus that have very, uh, plus might be very useful to check with the model. A local additive, a local additive. That property is really important. If you are using the breakdown plot for interpretation, remember that for this measure of importance, it's really good to know if the model is additive. Pues good. Using those plots, you can confirm if the model has this, that behavior. That's really interesting. That you know, based on this plot, how to how you what is the measure of importance that better fit it for the interpretation? So you are expecting that the profiles are in parallel to each other. So they should be they, they look go to the same shape. And also you want to know if the prediction is a stable. So the line should go close one to each other. So it's really important to know and to check all the Bible to also know if the prediction is accurate first and then it's, it's a stable, if you change some value, the prediction won't change too much. And so like that, that is important in order to take decisions. The limitation for this process is quite complex. Um, you know, the measures that we are doing are no objective for measuring the quality, but for exploration and have a general sense of what is going on, it's much better than don't doing it. You know, maybe I'm not perfect, maybe I'm not comparable for other models, you know, like a standard way to measure anything. But in this particular context, for that particular model, it should be a good reference to start over to make decisions. And now we, we can make the coding example. So let's pick the imputed the training data, the model train, and the observation of interest as always as a data frames. Now we can load the library random forest and create the explainer. After creating the explainer, passing the model, the data, just uh, removing the predicted value and also passing the predicted value that we want to predict, adding a label. And we can confirm that the explainer is working correctly based on this function. For this chart, we are going to introduce the predict diagnostic function. And here we can see the documentation from the original website. We, we can pass the explainer, the observation as a data frames, the variables 
we will see we will use it for the stability plot the number of bins to use for the residual histogram the number of neighbors that we want to extract and also the function distance and they are picking the goer gower distance function from the gower patch so to run this analysis, you need to also install that even though I think it's in the suggest a list of the description in the library. When you run the function like this, okay, you pass the explainer, the observation, the number of neighbors. And that's it. You will receive a list with the predict diagnostic class and we have a histogram and also a colmobrop, a snowball test that is a no parametric test for checking the difference between the means of residuals. Here we have the using the plot function with the result, we can see uh, the plot and we can see how the neighbors have a different distribution and have like two like two localizations they have like two distribution between and it they are not around zero we have more a, like a positive distribution and we can see like yeah the difference is relevant uh, uh for because the p value is really low Also, to run the stability plot, we just need to pass the variable to explore. In this case, we are exploring the age first. And then you just need to pass that result to the plot function. For this particular plot, the authors come and the profile are relatively close to each other. They follow a um, close suggesting stability in the prediction, so you won't get pretty different predictions at random. There are more negative than positive resid residuals. Yeah, you see the nice, yeah, there are more negatives, which might seem as a signal of local positive bias in the predictors. And we also can run the same analysis for a category. You can see how the categories are placed here. And the comments and the, the profile are not parallel. So yeah, there is no additivity in effect. So you shouldn't use the breakdown plots to make the interpretation. Uh, and also we can see that the and activity close to each other, so the, the, the profiles are relatively close to each other, so yes, in the stability in the prediction. So you won't you won't get really a far away the uh, predictions in the local sites. And that's it. Have any comments? Yeah, I'll just say uh yeah, thanks, Angel. Uh good presentation. Uh, as always, uh, you know, th this chapter was a, a little bit of a change of pace, which was nice in that we're not trying to explain how a prediction was was um, ar arrived at, right? Or was, you know, I think that was kind of the focus for the last several weeks here. This was really more of about model fit more than anything else, um, right? So it's a, it's a little bit different technique. You can't really compare these side by side like we were doing, you know, for, for the, you know, CP profiles and, and the Shapley values and all that stuff. This is kind of a different class of techniques. No, yeah, that, that's very important because if you, if you, I was planning, you were making a really important decision. You want to make sure how accurate is your prediction for that particular, because yeah, we see, for example, the example of the linear model and the exponential. You might say, oh, we have this, this, but you are not watching the shape. You know, you, when you have many variables, you cannot watch the shape. And based on these tennis, you can really see, oh, no, 
when this happens, we 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 lost visibility, and we can check how far out the residuals. Of course, the residuals are more, let's say, accurate when you uh, when you are watching a numeric prediction. Your predictor is numeric rather than a classification. That is here the example. Just also watching this part seems to me like. I would like to to check these profiles because defining a threshold, you know, sometimes when we are adding uh, using a threshold, we don't know what's the best position. But you see the the CP profile, and you know what's your number. You say no, it makes more sense maybe to place the threshold here in the twenty five, or maybe a little bit lower, you know, based on this contest. or the local instance. Mm -hmm. Let they, they me know, they didn't explain it that way, but I will use it in that way. <laughs> I will use, oh, I have these predictions and I want to make my best guess for this particular instance. It's not the general one, rule, you know. Might not be the general rule. I will, I will pick maybe a different, a different level. At least, for this other one, I mean, in the first also, sample. Also, just a comment is that, you know, we are only seeing these profiles for one model, right? For the random forest. Yeah, you know, for random forest. Maybe experimenting with different models, you know, like a gradient boosting or even a, you know, a, a KNM model. You know, we could see more or less, you know, which are the ones that the profiles are better you know, uh, you know, have have, have a better history as a story, you know, to tell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, yeah you know, the and, and, and and the you know the conclusion that I have here is not only because sometimes we just judge different models by a metric, right? You know, by uh, you know, uh, if if it's uh, accurate, the model. If has if he has the you know the best F one score, but then when we look at these graphs, then we have more tools to try to you know uh, understand how the model is working throughout all these you know uh, possible you know possible observations, and then try to get a better understanding of what where the model is is failing really okay where the model will be failing because eventually. All models are going to be, you know, failing in some in some area. Yeah, no, no, this like, uh, and you know, while I love the CP profile because you are not making any change to the data, you are not making any assumptions, you are just plotting the data. Across a range, you have a lot of contests. Correct. Yes. It's like this technique more than you know uh, a statistical technique. It's like a suggestion for how you should plot your data before you know making any conclusions. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you you find this charter useful. Uh, ah, for example, here in this case, uh, just watching here, uh, the the profiles. Uh, I see, for example, that. All the lines that are over, uh, they are a positive resource are over this range. It's like, I will pick my treasure like here, you know, like, like 45% to, to all this observation be a, have a positive result as, as the treasure. And maybe you know the fifty percent also looks good. It's like it's like around that, but sometimes maybe all the the plus are below. Um, because for particular for a classification, you don't have you won't ever have the the sad value for residuals, and it would be harder to 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 get a distribution around zeros.
Okay, I think we are done for this chapter. Uh, Ricardo have the, the next presentation, so I, I will stop.